Okay, going live in five seconds on Facebook. Ben, I'm going to start again. Good evening. Welcome to the virtual Da Vinci Days STEAM series. We've had a little delay in our audio tonight, so I hope you've been able to bear with us. My name is Nick Houtman. I'm a member of the Da Vinci Days Board of Directors. And in this time of COVID and social isolation, I'm coming to you from my home here in Corvallis. For many of you who know about Da Vinci Days, for more than 30 years, we've been celebrating the creative energy of this community. But just like for all of you, this has been a year like no other for Da Vinci Days. We've not been able to do our annual festival at the fairgrounds. We've moved our festivities online and, and into neighborhoods. We're inviting families to join the Kids Kinetic Challenge uh, at home, and to share their activities with photographs and video. And we're also gonna be having a, a fantastic uh, series of online concerts starting later in August and uh, a sidewalk chalk art exhibition that we're gonna be inviting families to display their best chalk art uh, on the street in front of their house. And perhaps with photos and video create a uh, a, a, a tour that people can do on their own. If they're staying socially distant. So if you want to check out davincidays.org online or the Da Vinci Days Facebook page, you'll find what's coming up and something that might be fun to do with your family in this strange summer that we're having. Of course, this is our very first virtual presentation. We've been working on this process for a few weeks, but we ask you to be patient with us as we smooth out the bugs. And it is, uh, it's coming together. Uh, feel free to send us a message on Facebook uh, or a, a message in the chat room. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to know who's out there. Uh, we'll be taking questions as well. If you have questions for our speaker later on, please put them on Facebook and uh, Carol Holbrook, our executive director, is going to be monitoring that channel and we'll be posing those questions to, to David Blunk here in, in a while. A few thank yous are also in order before we get to our presentation. Our sponsors have stepped up this year to keep Da Vinci Days free and accessible to the public. And they are the city of Corvallis, Benton County, HP, and Corvus. And we received donations from the public and I'd like to also thank a couple of people, our, our producer behind the scenes here, Ben Potter, who is making it possible for us to stream this presentation through Zoom and through Facebook Live, and our executive director, uh, Carol Hobrock, who, I, as I mentioned, is monitoring the questions and comments. Now, the STEAM series aims to capture the spirit of creativity in five areas, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And our theme this year is Ignite, in other words, we're looking for, for, uh, for presentations and, and trying to inspire people with a variety of, of topics that, that are that, that, uh, that creative spark that we have in this town. And for the next five weeks, we'll be hearing about wildfire, about augmented reality, about renewable energy and music. So we hope you can join us uh, for each of these events Tuesdays at six o'clock for the next five weeks. And starting off tonight, our talk will take a deep look at fire itself. You know, much of what we take for granted in modern life, the trans transportation system, the electric grid, the energy that's, that runs our farms and our factories, it all starts with combustion. David Blunk is a, an associate professor at the College of Engineering at Oregon State University, and he studies the technologies that enable and control this force of nature. His research endeavors to understand the science of the practical. Think of a gas turbine engine, for example, and the natural forest fires through the conversion of chemical energy. David is the lead investigator on more than $3 million worth of funded research at Oregon State and has, mainly, has contributed to, uh, to collaborations nationally and internationally. So David, 
please take it away. All right, well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate being able to be with you today. And uh, my family does as well. I'm sure we will hear from them today. So uh, like everybody, it is uh, interesting. Uh, all right, so let me get my presentation going here. All right, well, uh, Nick, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I am uh, excited to be with you tonight. Um, I, I appreciate everybody joining us tonight, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to be able to talk with you tonight, and appreciate your flexibility in this uh, epic year and this year of flexibility. Um, before I begin, I certainly need, need to acknowledge a whole slew of who students who frankly do the, do the real work or the hard work. Um, I, I've been, it's been my privilege to work with many great students. And then certainly a lot, um, the work that I will show today has all been funded by different organizations. Some associated with the Department of Defense, some with the Department of Energy, some with um, like the Department of the Interior. So uh, I appreciate all the, the people, the students who've done the work and then also the funding that's, that's made this all possible. All right, so tonight um, I'm gonna talk about combustors. I'm gonna talk about wildfires. I'm gonna talk about turbulent flames as a Bunsen burner flame. I'm gonna talk about detonations. And, and for signposting, I'll spend the most time talking about wildfire and I thought that would be an appropriate one to dive into more of the, the research and approach. And the other ones will be more of a, a quick overview, an introduction to this, this aspect of, of combustion. So I have three goals for tonight. Um, first of all, my first goal is to share with the audience some life lessons. Um, I, as I got ready for this meeting, I realized that as I viewed presentations, typically it's not the technical content that I remember, but it's the, the stories that the people share, that something clicks with me. And my hope is that, that something I'll say tonight, in particular for the young audience or the young heart, uh, will stick and, and be a benefit for them in, in, their, in their lives. And I have three life lessons that I'll point out as I go along. The second aspect that I'll share tonight um, is I hope to gain, that all of us can gain a great appreciation for the science of fire and combustion. And then finally, let's have some fun. It has been a, a year for the record books and I hope that we can have some fun uh, as we go along tonight. So um, I thought it would be helpful to at least introduce myself and tell my story, so to speak. Um, as my wife would say, I need to be real with people and uh, I just didn't wake up at Oregon State studying combustion. There's a bit of a backstory to it. And to begin with, I think the story starts for me um, right here. And those who have, uh, are associated with farming in the Pacific Northwest, particularly Oregon, might recognize this. This is the picture looking down from a combine. And those not familiar, combine is a harvester that farmers use. And you can harvest uh, grain, um, things like corn or wheat or grass seed. And uh, I remember distinctly, I was a teenager working on a farm in, in Eastern Oregon. And uh, I was enthralled as I was driving this combine, I would push the throttle forward and back. And I just loved the sound of the engine revving up. And there was something inside me that just got excited. Now, fast forward 25 years. And uh, I, this last weekend, I was out with my son. This is an R combine, but I was out combining with him so he could get that same experience. I didn't ask him if he got the same thrill that I did, but um, that was the beginning. So, so now fast forward, graduated from high school, uh, went off to college, I served a mission for my church, and uh, I actually started out studying interpersonal communications. Um, I like to speak, hopefully that comes through, and I was on the speech and debate team, and so I thought, well, that's what I'll study. And I did that for a semester and realized I wasn't uh, especially enjoying it or, or wasn't terribly satisfying to me. And my mom has suggested I switch over to mechanical engineering, so moms know best, so I switched to mechanical engineering. And so for the first about three years of mechanical engineering, I, I enjoyed it. It was certainly challenging and that was rewarding, um, but I didn't know really what, what I was gonna be passionate about. And that changed when I started taking um, a class in thermodynamics 
And in my field, that is where we study things like engines and how energy is transferred. And that same excitement when I was driving that combine came back to me. And I just found that, that thrill that I experienced in person, now I can understand the thrill and how the, the science and engineering behind it. And so I earned a bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University out in Utah. And uh, about that same time, I realized that I was interested in research and interested in teaching. And a good fit then is to be a professor. And so to be a professor, you, you typically need a PhD. So I went off to Purdue to earn a PhD and I continued to dabble in combustion, um, but primarily studied how heat is transferred through infrared radiation. And about the time I was gonna graduate, I had a job opportunity to work at a national lab called Air Force Research Laboratory. And I'll talk a bit more that what I did there in a second. Um, but there I dived into combustion and particularly focused on various aspects of combustion related to gas turbine engine combustors. So that was the, the middle. And of course, now the end, hopefully not the end, but I'm um, at Oregon State and I've been here about seven years and I had just a fantastic uh, experience. And I like to joke that I am a paid pyro and uh, it's, it's actually fairly true when I say that. Uh, this is a picture of my research group pre-COVID days when you could stand next to each other, stand to, to be next to each other. And it's my privilege, and this is the most rewarding part of my job, is to be able to work with some uh, excellent graduate students and then also undergraduate students and be able to, to mentor them and learn from them and with them. And uh, the other hat that I roll is uh, my dad with have, have four kids, four boys. And uh, we have uh, gone back to my farming roots and we have a small hobby farm, no combines, um, but, but gone back to my farming roots and that has enabled opportunities I'll talk about today. So with that uh, introduction, let me, uh, I'm going to first talk a bit about the basics of combustion and I'll give some applications like I, like I alluded to. So I'll pause right now and uh, recap life lesson number one. And uh, the first life lesson, and again, this is tailored maybe toward the, the younger audience or the younger heart, um, but learn to be a doer so that you are fulfilled and you can gain the respect of those around you and your experiences can be a significant asset. When I went to get a PhD, that was probably one of the three most hardest things I've ever done in my life. And honestly, there are times that I wanted to quit but about halfway through my experience, something changed and I realized that I, I wasn't being a doer, that I wasn't focused on doing the best I could. Um, I was just going in and, and frankly trying to punch the clock a bit. And I realized that I had to um, work harder and to, to accomplish, to really have impactful results. And I think it's fair to say because of that change in mindset and how I approached it, that enabled my job at Air Force Research Lab and that opened the opportunity for the job here at Oregon State. Uh, and then I've been able to study some of the some of what I think is the most uh, interesting things in the world. So learn to be a doer, be an accomplisher. Um, if I may say for a second, it's, it's uh, doing as much more than typically time electronics or video games or things like that. It's actually accomplishing, it's developing, it's creating. And if we do that, um, people notice and then they become an asset for life. And I'll tie that in uh, here in a bit. So that uh, life lesson number one, let me transition and talk a little bit about, well, what is combustion? And so one way to think about combustion is it's a rapid oxidation. So you have a fuel and it's reacting with oxygen and the process it produces heat. All right, so what I'm showing here on the left-hand side, this is a methane illustration of what we think about for a methane atom. And for those of burn natural gas, most natural, most of what's in natural gas is methane, okay? So we have this methane, and typically most things that we burn in society are have carbon, hydrogen, sometimes some oxygen on it, but typically it's carbon, hydrogen. And then we have oxygen atom that'll come along, and those two, those two react. And the analogy I think that makes sense, at least to me, is you think about going sledding. You're gonna take a, a sled and you gotta put energy into it and you're gonna walk up to the top of that hill, and that's essentially what's contained in these bonds between the carbon and hydrogen and then for the oxygen. There's bonds that set up and that's where the energy is stored. And then um, as we all know, just by putting methane or natural gas and oxygen together or propane or whatever fuel, typically it just doesn't light on its own. 
um, you need a high temperature and ignition source to be able to, to get it to, to proceed. And to me, going back to our sledding analogy, to me, when I usually, when I sit on the top of the hill, I sit down and nothing happens. But if I push, push along, kind of get up and over that hump or get, uh, get going, then it'll proceed. And if I don't put a brake on, I'll just keep going down to the bottom of the hill. And that's what happens with the combustion. So if I have my, in this case, methane and oxygen, I put an ignition source, which is basically a high temperature. <clears throat> that will cause those bonds to begin to change and the energy be to be converted. And the final product for, for most combustion processes is water, which I'm illustrating right here, and carbon dioxide. Those are the two typical products. And so just like if I'm at the top of the hill and if I get going, my momentum will carry me down to the bottom, the same is true for combustion. These energy associated with these bonds breaks apart. And at the bottom of that hill, so to speak, is water and CO2. And in the process, we, we release heat. All right. So that's true for methane. But what about more complicated fuels? So if I have a fuel like jet fuel, which is used to obviously fly uh, flies all over the world, or even more complicated fuels like forest products, while the carbon and hydrogen molecule is more complicated, after it begins to burn, typically those begin to break down to building blocks like methane or ethylene or even hydrogen or carbon dioxide. So this process is the same. There's just more reactions that occur upstream of this process. So that's combustion in a, in a nutshell. All right, so the next question I thought it, we should chat about is, why are flames yellow? And then the related question is, are yellow flames, the are, is the yellow portion the hottest part of the flame? Well, to appreciate that, let's go back to our simple uh, hydrocarbon reaction. When I shared this, I, I oversimplified it. Um, and I assume that all of the, there was enough oxygen to burn all the methane and there wasn't any extra fuel or oxides are left over. In practice, frequently have a situation where there's extra oxygen or extra fuel that, that's present. If we have a situation where there's not enough oxygen, then we have basically an extra carbon atoms that begin to float around. And if there's not oxygen, they wanna react with something else. The bonds are broken, but they wanna to react to something else. And so one of the products that they may form is something called soot. And soot is a series of carbon atoms that bond together. And they actually can become, can become fairly large for, for molecules and, and fairly complicated. And when we look at a flame and we see smoke, that's actually the presence of soot particles. Now, it turns out that even in where the yellow portion is or where the flame is, there's lots of soot particles. In particular, for a fire like this, there's not enough oxygen at the base of the flame to burn all the fuel. And so we have soot particles. And as they move away from the flame front, there, there's more oxygen available. And the oxygen comes in, it takes the soot, the soot reacts, and then uh, forms carbon dioxide, or carbon monoxide, and then carbon dioxide. All right, so why are the flames yellow? Well, all of these soot particles in the flame, they heat up, similar to an incandescent light bulb, and as they heat up, heat up at, they get hot enough, then they give off visible light. And that's why the flame uh, looks yellow, is because it has soot particles in there or the, what's, um, what goes in to make smoke. Now, going to my second question, is this the hottest part of the flame? Well, the answer is, Yes or no. <laughs> um, so it's yellow because it's hot enough. But when it when these flames give off heat and they become yellow, they're they're losing some of their heat to their surroundings. So if you have a flame that's partially blue, maybe another common color, or yellow, the bluest portion would typically be the hottest, and then the yellow, and then certainly it's cooler down here. Now the third primer question to get the foundation, and maybe the most important question that I did is. Why are flames so fun? And the short answer is, I don't know. You got to ask the experts. And I would say the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of America, those are experts of why uh, fire is so fun. Um, but I will take a moment and comment on the right-hand side here. This is a turbulent Bunsen burner. So think about a Bunsen burner, perhaps in high school chemistry, but now it's on steroids. We're flowing a lot more uh, fuel and air through it. And that's what makes it so convoluted. It's, it's a turbulent flame. And believe it or not, with this flame right here, there's no artificial coloring, just changing of the, the light settings for the camera. 
And this flame, what makes this flame so important is we were actually burning jet fuel and vaporizing it. So heating up to about, oh, about 200 Celsius, about 475 degrees Fahrenheit. The, the air, the fuel and air came out, it burns. And we were studying this to better understand how flames inside combustors behave. Uh, much of my work, all my work is tied to some application. One of the challenges is most applications you can't study inside it, um, either because they're too expensive or it's too complicated or the moment you take it apart, you'll disturb it. And so most of the work I'll show you today is simpler type combustion devices that we use to better understand some practical application. So with that background, I have one slide and, and I preface this, why should you and I care about combustion? And I have uh, four phrases that I think capture it. Disneyland, airplane rides, air conditioners, and food. I think uh, all four of those are near and dear to our hearts. And as of last night, we bought our first air conditioned unit. So that is now important to the Blunk household. Um, but all of these have uh, at least one thing in common, and that's energy. Um, Every uh, innovation in society or every advancement in our, our standard of living has come with, with energy. Um, whether it be getting to Disneyland, building Disneyland, whether it be the creating building manufacturing air conditioning units, whether it be the fuel used for tractors for agriculture, all of it is associated with energy. Now, certainly there are other sources of energy out there. Um, historically, though, society has used combustion because typically it's fairly, it's historically less expensive. And then also the energy density is relatively high. So, um, one of the reasons why airplanes are not flying in batteries is there's just not enough energy we can pack into a battery compared to a gallon of, of jet fuel. And so combustion has been a way historically society has released energy, which is then in turn, we've used it to advance or improve our standard of living. Now, certainly there are many alternative forms of energy and those are moved forward and, and that's great. I'm certainly a, an advocate for all of those, but in the near term, we're still using combustion and, and, and will for, for a lot of applications. The second aspect of why we should care about combustion, at least from my perspective, um, is summarized by this, these phrases, Paradise, California, Old Faithful from the 1980s, our older audience members may remember that, and then the Columbia River Gorge, um, all of these are associated with wildfires um, that impacted us locally or nationally. And uh, whether we like it or not, uh, forest fires are, are not going away. And uh, typically as humans, we tend to associate them with negative, right? Because they, they're burning, they're making things brown, they burn a house or a community. Um, but also it's an essential part of, of mother nature. And uh, I, I'm certainly not against prescribed burns. I think there's a lot of benefits to it and the wildfires aren't going away. And so we have to learn to live with it. So for two reasons, both as energy users and as people that live in a, in a world where there's wildfires, combustion is gonna be something we should, uh, that's important to us and something that um, people like I sh should study so we can better understand how to control, harness or, or avoid them. Okay, so with that, let me, uh, again, I'm gonna give you an overview for a few of the topics of different aspects. And my goal with this is to give a breadth of different applications of combustion, give you maybe a tidbit or two about them, and I'll give uh, my wildfire research more of a case study of how we can do research on combustion. So the first topic that I'll uh, talk about is gas turbine engine combustors. And most of my work at Air Force Research Lab related to gas turbine engine combustors in some way. And uh, I was able to be part of a team where we were trying to develop the smallest gas turbine engine combustor in the world. We want to reduce the length by 30%. And if you reduce the length, you can reduce the size of an engine. And then with that extra weight or size, do other things that are of interest to the Air Force. And so what I'm showing right here in the bottom left-hand side, this is the design for that combustor that we were evaluating. Air is coming from left to right. I hope you can see my cursor. And we actually injected the fuel in this bottom portion. This is called a cavity and that's where the fuel was. And so we were doing studies um, where we were looking at where does the fuel burn? I talked about how sometimes fuel it burns when it's fuel rich, when, it's not, when there's not enough oxygen, sometimes when there's lots of oxygen. And so for reference in this cavity, that will be fuel rich. Then we 
the fuel the, and combustion products would move upward, the air would come in and mix, and then what actually exits the combustor is fuel lean. And that's why when a combustor, let's say if you're sitting at the airport watching engines, typically an engine, you don't see smoke coming out the back end or just when it idles up or starts, do you see that smoke come out? And that's because ultimately it's fuel lean overall. So we were doing work. This is a top-down view and a side view we were, we, where we were analyzing the combustion behavior inside this combustor. And what I get excited about when I look at this, this is about the size, and these are represented conditions of the engines that fly us all over the world. Now, we were trying to innovate on that, but this is the type of size um, and pressure and temperatures that are realistic of what flies us around the world. And it turns out that it's actually a very small volume in the engine where the flame is. And that's because it's operating at higher pressure. And so you can burn uh, more fuel and more air in that much smaller environment. So what I'm gonna show you now is some videos. I showed you the cavity. So this is a side view of the cavity. And first I'm gonna show you a visible image and these are that we would take these videos and then try to analyze, well, where's the flame sitting? Why is it sitting there? And then try to understand, link that back to the, the behavior of the combustor. Oops. Okay, so here's our side view of the combustor. Fuel is coming in where my arrow is shown. We had air that came in below it and air that came in the pot on the side. And you note there's a vortex that sets up in the center of our cavity. And that was intentional because we wanted the fuel to stay in this cavity for as long as possible and to burn and begin to break down and then it could leave through the top. Now, if, if this is, if we, this is visible images, if we look at this CH, um, this is a minor species that happens in the process of forming CO2 and water. Another way to think of it is this tends to be where we have fuel rich regions in our combustor. And so we see that right above the fuel jet um, in the region where there's not as much air. Now we see a fair amount of CH radicals that are emitting. Similar story looking at OH, which is another radical that, that forms while we're forming carbon dioxide and water. But now the CO occurs relatively close to where we have our, our air jets. And so we use information like this to understand combustion behavior and, and frankly to begin to tailor tweak the placement and the size for the fuel nozzles and the air jets, ultimately trying to improve the behavior, the performance of these engines. All right, a little closer to home. Um, when I came to Oregon State, engineers at Air Force Research Lab contacted me and said, we are interested in sponsoring uh, senior uh, engineering students and building a gas turbine engine, uh, an afterburner for gas turbine engines. So, in a gas turbine engine combustor, that's this small portion right here. That's There's no flame that comes out if you've done your job right. In an afterburner, you inject fuel and air into the exhaust of the gas turbine engine combustor. And in the process, you can have a flame that shoots out. And my first thought was, they're crazy. Uh, companies like General Electric and Pratt & Whitney and Rolls-Royce, who make gas turbine engine combustors, spend millions of dollars trying to optimize and design the afterburners. And now some seniors from Oregon State University are gonna be asked to do that. Um, but I didn't tell them no, I didn't tell the students they're crazy, but that's what I thought. Fast forward now, and this is results from the testing. Can you hear that audio, Nick? All right, so I will skip forward to this. And let me see if I can get. Okay, there we go. Wait for it. Up. Yeah, yeah, quite loud. <laughs> over the sound of the audio. Okay, so uh, that was a, a video of 
um, gas turbine engine, an afterburner for gas turbine engine that senior mechanical engineering students designed and tested. And uh, since this is associated with OSU, I will take a moment just to brag and say that um, some of the engineers at AFRL thought it was one of the, the top top projects out of like 30 some that they'd seen up to the point. The, engine, the students did just a fantastic job. Okay, so I'm gonna transition from something man-made, so combustors, gas turbine engines, and now I'm gonna talk about fire, forest fires. And, um, and I will use the next, I have a video here, that I think I use this for the motivation. Uh, this is part of the Discovery Channel. And Nick, flag me down if the audio doesn't come through for some reason. But, but I think this will give the motivation and I'll link it back to Oregon State. Nobody believed it would jump their river. Somehow it found a way. That's when things started to get really serious for us. Just the sheer magnitude of the fire, I think it surprised everyone. There's a lot of black spruce in that area. They got those cones on them. When they go up, they kind of explode and they just send embers and flames everywhere. As the fire raged, it sent burning embers and firebrands flying across the Athabasca River at a point where it was nearly 500 meters across. Stoked by high winds, embers have been observed to travel a staggering 11 kilometers from the head of a fire. And their role in the spread of fire and their threat to structures is well known. Researchers at Oregon State University are using infrared photography to learn more about how embers form and spread. Invisible to the naked eye, infrared images reveal the sheer volume of embers emitted and hint at the damage they can do. And ember so that was work that a student did. Um, they, they were fortunate to work with the Nature Conservancy of Oregon. And he went out when they did a prescribed burn of juniper trees and, and collect those, those images. Um, a bit closer to home, for those who remember the fire in the Columbia Gorge, what, two or three summers ago, the fire actually jumped the river about two miles and started burning on the Washington side. Um, as we started this research project, one aspect that maybe the least understood aspect is really the generation of those embers. Um, we'd like to be able to say for this species of tree or this type of tree, this size of tree, here's how the number of firebrands will change. And if we know that, that can help with reducing the risk associated with wildfires. So the research I'm going to share is really our goal is to better understand what's controlling firebrands. Um, and I'm going to share just briefly results from branch scales, so things that we can do in the lab and control all the variables. Tree scale, where we can control some of the variables, but it's more realistic, what we'll actually have. And I'll talk just briefly about forest scale. And the takeaway message from this is going to be, from this study is, if I boil down to one thing, it's this, that the most important parameter that we found, you know, we have finite constraints we could study, is that the species type is the most important parameter influencing ember generation. The type of species that's burning is the most important parameter influencing ember. Now, the caveat to that is we have not been able to test our tree scale for varying wind speed to evaluate that. All right, so um, how do you tackle a problem like that? We'd love to go in the forest and collect and study it, but it's just not practical for many, many reasons. So we start out, we start out in a lab scale study and we would take dowels or twigs, insert them. There's a series of torches down below and we would burn them. We'd stick them in there and we'd, we'd measure how long they were in the flames before they broke off. And then we said, all right, so those that break off more easily, generate more easily. That becomes our independent or dependent variable. And then we went on to vary parameters such as the number, the size, the moisture content, the species, trying to tease out which have the greatest influence on the time to generation. And then we went on to get results like this. And this is just saying where we change our diameter, temperature, velocity, et cetera. And the mean square is just looking at the significance statistically. The value is not important, but, but the ranking is. So we found that the diameter is, was the most important thing, even more important than changing the wind speed within the range that we studied or even the species. Okay. Then we went on and then we looked at coupled interaction, same type of story. And so, and I have a whole slew of results I could share. 
Um, but about this time, we went in and, and began to look at our tree scale studies, where we begin to get physics that are more representative of actual wire, wildfires. And I was struggling with this a bit. Well, we measure diameter, so surely diameter is going to be the important parameter that influences tree scale. So this just illustrates a, a picture of our experiment. For reference, these trees were about 12 feet tall or so. So our study went like this. We placed our trees, um, and this was here actually over in Albany, Oregon, put straw underneath, and then we deployed pieces of fabric, which are fire resistant, or trays of water. The fabric collects embers, and the embers that are hot leave spots, they're char marks, and the trays collect all the embers. And so we're capturing basically the hot embers, the total number of embers, and then we varied a whole slew of parameters, which aren't important for our conversation today. We had put straw bed around the trees. We'd light the straw bed and then, and then quantify the emitters that were released from the trees. And this is what a video looked like. This is a juniper tree. That was one of the species that we studied. The flame comes along, begins to light some of the lower fuel. It's called ladder fuel. And in some cases, the fuel flames then propagate up essentially along the length of the tree. So again, this tree is about 12 feet tall. And in the process, we can't see it, but there's a slew of firebrands or embers that are produced, and then they are then deposited downwind of it. And we collected all those. And we would then analyze the size, the number, the shape. There's char marks on the fabric, which I mentioned. All right, and so then we begin to get results like this. So this is distance from the tree. This is the number of embers per meter squared. So there's a certain area with the fabric. We quantify the number of embers that land on the fabric um, or in the trays of water and then divide by the area. And what we're looking at is different species of the tree. We were looking at Douglas fir, Grand fir, Ponderosa pine, and Western juniper. And if you look at these say, well, there's a spread, that's the point. What we found quite quickly is that there's a sensitivity to the species of trees. Uh, and we looked at the char marks. This is the results from the fabric. And again, there's a spread in the data, suggesting that there's a species dependence. We also looked at the mass loss. So the different trees would get burn different amounts. And we wanted to say, well, how does that relate to different species of trees in the flux? Do we have a relation between I burn more tree, I get more firebrands, and for some species, perhaps, for other species, no. Um, we also did a similar type analysis looking at char marks. Those are hot firebrands. And then we begin to say, all right, so if we take the number flux and normalize by the amount of fuel that's consumed, what insight do we give? And again, we see a spread as we go between different species of trees. This is embers. This is the char mark. So this is the hot firebrands. And then what was insightful for us was if we look at the ratio between the hot firebrands and the total number, there's a great spread in our species and people had never considered this before. All right, and then we've also gone on to do work looking at, oh, so I have conclusions here, I won't bore you with those. But the takeaway message was this, that the species type is the most important parameter influencing ember generation. And I started by talking about our lab scale study and saying, that we found that it was diameter and then species. But as, I was, as we thought about it, we realized that the diameter of a tree or of, of a branch or needle is really is greatly influenced by the species of the tree, right? There, there's inherent characteristics of the diameter and the, and the relative size of branches or twigs. And so diameter also includes a species dependence. And so both our lab scale studies and tree scale studies found that the species had the greatest influence in our studies. And we went on and did some field work, and certainly it's not conclusive by any means, but it at least um, supports or aligns with the trends we're finding. All right, so let me pause now and give my life lesson number two. And I'll dedicate this to any, uh, perhaps if I have any nieces or nephews on the line, I'll dedicate it to them. One of the things that I, I uh, have found is this idea of thinking outside the box. Um, I know of only one other organization that has ever burned large trees like we have. Well, let me back up. A, um, more than 10 live uh, tr trees like we have. We burned 108 trees. 
I know of no other university that's ever done a study like that. That came because we hit a roadblock and thought, well, how else can we do this? And I realized that um, I lived on a hobby farm and at a gravel pit or a gravel driveway and uh, I could burn it here. That was outside the box. Most folks at universities uh, haven't thought that way. And that has enabled some research that I think is quite pioneering and given us great in, uh, insightful. The second part to that is think also about the impact of whatever you do in your, in your life. When we deliberately designed that study to go from lab scale all the way up to forest scale, because we wanted the most impact from that work. I could do some nice study in the lab and maybe publish a paper, but, but would it really make a difference? And as we've tried to anchor ourselves in impact, I think we find research that's, and it's not just research, it's just, it's life. As we think about impact we can have, um, we get the most results and, and people recognize that and it leads to new opportunities. Okay, so as I, as I wrap up, let me transition and talk just briefly about, actually I'll ignore smoldering combustion um, I will leave it with this hook to say that to some extent, smoldering combustion is much worse for the environment than flaming combustion. Flaming combustion gets all the, the headlines for, for perhaps good reason, but as a person not directly living next to fire, you know, my house isn't threatened, smoldering combustion is, is the bigger concern for me because it's a less complete form of combustion. All right. Um, Okay, so the last piece that I'll wrap up with tonight is talking about detonations. So I've gone from combustion in a wildfire and those flames go about on the order of foot per second, several feet per second. Now detonation is different because the flame is going, the flame front is going about one mile per second. So a detonation is a supersonic combustion and there's a shock wave um, that's coupled with a reaction front. The two are coupled together. So I have this large pressure spike that's moving forward and that pressure spike is then reacting with the, the flames, the combustion, and the combustion is then helping that pressure wave to go forward. And one of the uh, more cutting edges of combustion research is, is looking to use this for propulsion because it's a lot more efficient and not just like a tube, but actually put it in a combustor um, these, these have the potential to be much more of, of, um, efficient from a cycle perspective. You burn less fuel. So what I'm going to show you now, this is a pulse detonation engine at the Propulsion Lab at Oregon State. Some of you uh, may have heard it. In fact, today I think that it was running. And uh, I'll share it with you. So they fill it up with the fuel and air. They light it on one end. It comes in just essentially as a small flame. It accelerates and comes out as a as a detonation. All right, the final life lesson that I'll share with tonight, I, I hope this is valuable, um, do hard things and don't be afraid of it. Um, I think about these research projects, I never personally studied detonation again, it, it was hard, probably harder for the students, but, but we did it. I had never studied forest fire research. I was a gas turbine engine, combust gas turbine engine combustor guy and then I studied forest fire. Um, we go out in the field. We, we uh, were out in the field a few months ago harvesting 20 foot tall trees and bringing them to be burned uh, as the next phase of our project. Those was really heavy and it was really hard to get approval to do it, but we did. And uh, so those younger in the, in, the, in the audience, I encourage you to do hard things. Um, it pays off and maybe more important is it'll pay off and, and that's how you can make an impact in the world and uh, help improve the world. And so with that, this is my contact uh, information. I certainly invite questions beyond just tonight. Feel free to reach out to me, um, but especially uh, students or those younger in the audience, if I can be of any help, please let me know. And that uh, wraps up my presentation. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate your taking the time to talk with us about your work tonight. We've got a, a few questions that have come in. Uh, so why don't we just start off with, with those and uh, for people in the audience, feel free to uh, send a question, uh, post a question to Facebook Live. Uh, Carol Hobrick is uh, taking a look at those and will forward them on to me so I can share them with our speaker. Uh, the, the first question we have for you from the audience is, does your work help forest fires, uh, forest fi fire uh, fighters strategize in their work 
uh, on the ground in responding to fires? Do you, is, or is that your aspiration? Yeah, I, and I like the word aspiration, absolutely. Um, we have shared it with folks from the Forest Service and they, there's part of a working group that um, basically deals with education. And so they can then share that and we've shared those results with them. I don't know if they've used that or not. Um, another tie into our research um, that we're doing right now is if we can study by firebrands, that can then be used to improve models and the models can be used to help far, uh, wildfire, so, or firefighters. So we're fairly upstream of, of directly helping them, but that's our application. In fact, I went to, I presented our works with a group of fire marshals down in central Oregon last year because I want to transition that, that work and results. Um, and yeah, but there's always more piece of the puzzle to, to directly make that happen, but we're, that's, that, that's a big motivation. <laughs> Another question relates to the gas turbine engine work uh, that you talked about initially. Uh, then the question is, do you feel like those tests were successful? And if you do, what makes you say so? Yeah, uh, there's several layers to that, but but I think each layer I would say yes. For the first layer, um, we found we were measuring the combustion efficiency, so how much of the fuel was burned, and we're measuring the pollution that was emitted from those combustors. That, that, that's the big constraint. If you can't satisfy that, it doesn't matter, it's, it's not gonna work. And those results were quite promising. Um, so that's the first layer. But, the, but more importantly, at, at the National Lab, we weren't in the business of ever creating or frankly designing an entire engine, but our, our primary goal was to um, dabble in research that was higher risk and then share the results with gas turbine engine companies. And I know at least one gas turbine engine company that was interested in that work and then had a roadmap to begin using it. Now, where it went, I'm not sure, but um, I, I believe they went down that, that. So from that aspect, that transition aspect, I, I think that was a success. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question goes back to wildfires. Uh, you mentioned that smoldering fires appear to be more dangerous than fires that are actually flaming. Uh, what make, what, what, why do you say that? What is the danger from smoldering? All right, my hook, my hook worked, huh? All right, well, <laughs> I'll go, that's an excuse, go back to that slide. T two things here. Um, so if you recall, there was the fire, for many of you recall, there was the fire in the gorge three summers, uh, two or three summers ago, okay? Um, and this was just a headline, firefighters respond to a flare up of smoldering timber in the Columbia River Gorge early this morning. No big deal, right? Um, what's interesting in this, this is actually the winter after the burns in the gorge. So an entire winter when the, all the rain in the gorge, perhaps snow, and there's still a smoldering combustion. Smoldering combustion can exist with much lower oxygen and much lower temperatures, and it can linger for months, years. Um, and so that's one of the challenges of smoldering. But when I said the threat, um, it's really captured in this image right here, and it's just the smoke that gives off. Smoldering per pound of fuel consumed gives off much more pollution, um, both smoke, more CO, the other crud and also tends to stay lower to the ground. And so flaming from like a burning a house perspective, you know, that, that's, that's a big concern. Um, but from a pollution perspective as someone who's a bit removed, but I breathe the air, um, that's what the concern is for smoldering. Um, in fact, don't quote me on this, but um, in Indonesia, they have very, very thick peat bogs and that likes to smolder when it, when it dries out. And then some big smoldering fires that they just did, didn't get put out. I think it was back in the late uh, 1990s. But uh, on that year, I think it was something like 7% of the global CO2 emissions came from those burns, something like that. I mean, it's just, just staggering the amount of pollution that was released from those. And it's because they're lower temperature and there's less oxygen, so they just, they don't burn as efficiently. Wow, and, and those fires can just smolder for long, long, long periods of time. Yeah, the gorge. I mean, they get incredible amounts yeah. of rain and it's cold and, and it's still lingered yeah. there, for one example. Yeah. Uh, we have another question about your first life lesson. You talked about being a doer. Uh, can you t give us some tips about how you develop the mindset of being a doer? Boy, could, how do you develop the mindset to be a doer? Um, and, and certainly, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I, but I strive for it. Um, when I had that realization in my, I'm a PhD program, um, what I found was I was, 
basically stumbling because I didn't see the end. I didn't know how all the things I was working on would come together. And I, and I just spin my wheels. And I just decided that I, I couldn't control that so well, but I could control how hard I worked. And my goal was, was when I was there working, I would outwork anybody else in the lab. I would hustle, I would run, I would just say, and that, say all right, what can I get done today? Now you don't want to cut corners, right? But also you could do things very efficiently. And that was my goal, was to outwork any, any other grad student there. Now, with that said, I went home and I lived life. I, it wasn't that I, I stopped living life and have a balance in life, um, but I decided when I was working, I would outwork anybody. So that was one of the ways I could be to do her. Um, the other piece that I would recommend is think about the impact of whatever you're doing. Um, I, I am aware of this when I do research because I can roast something that's really nice science, science and, and there's value to that. But why not focus on where there's science, but also I can say, if we, if we understand this, the world will be safer, the world will be better, or some way that what I do can make an impact. Um, I'm getting a bit of a leadership role at Oregon State where I work with undergraduate uh, engineering students. I got into that because of impact. It's nothing to do with research, but in my mind, I thought, all right, so what's my legacy gonna be? How can I really make a difference um, in the world? So I think it's a mindset of thinking about what's my impact and put in that effort to be an accomplisher. And, and I think volunteering also, being a person to step up and say, hey, I'll do that. I was in a leadership meeting yesterday, told the school head, hey, why don't I just do this, right? That's a way I can make an impact and, and be a doer. Hopefully that wasn't too long for whoever asked the question. <laughs> Thank you. No, that, those, those are all, all sensible, thoughtful uh, responses. And of course, balanced with your, you mentioned kind of work family balance, which is always a tricky thing to achieve, especially in the academic environment where people are being pushed to work a lot, uh, but have families that absolutely need us to take care of each other. Yep. Yes. Uh, another question uh, goes a little bit back to the impact of your work. Uh, wondering if this person's wondering how, if foresters in planning reforestation uh, activities can take advantage of your ember work uh, to develop uh, plantations if it's that or to develop new forests as they grow that are less prone to generating huge amounts of embers and yeah. higher fire risk? Yeah. Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, the answer is yes, and I'll put an asterisk by it. I, I absolutely believe that our, our results um, indicate that there are certain species, our results show there are certain species that are more prone to generate embers or more prone to generate hot embers. Now, the asterisk there is I also realize there's a lot of other factors like ecosystems and how they grow and all that. But if you were to say just from a risk perspective, could we um, recommend different species? Tree? Absolutely, I would. And I think even take a look closer, like homeowners, right? You know, we are a little more control of the force around us or things like that. Or I've also thought about, you know, as a if we can get this information out there, then hopefully responders can realize, oh, you know, there's there's a fire and there's this species of tree, there's a greater risk of fire brand and spot fire ignition, or, you know, it's not as big of a concern. Okay, thank you. We're getting close to the end of our program here, and I wanted to share one last question with you. How do you protect yourself and your students in work, in doing this dangerous work? Working with fire is pretty risky stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the, and this is going to sound really silly, but the epiphany that I had, again, this is sounds silly, um, fairly new at Oregon State. I just had, I had the thought, if one of my students was seriously hurt, um, I don't know what I would do. I, I, I don't know if I could continue my job. I mean, it, it would be crushing, It'd be crushing. And certainly there's nothing that we're doing is so important that, that students need to, to take significant or unnecessary risk and even unnecessary like risk that we can't mitigate so with that said um a couple things in our labs some of our experiments are so are, there's so much risk that students never are beside it when they're running an experiment there's beside it they're, they're not beside it and we have features that like we will disconnect power so there's no way that it can turn on unless the students cleared out that's kind of the more extreme other ones in a lab where a student needs to be next to it or in the area um, we develop for each experiment a set of safety protocol and we basically go for the risks and we say, all right, so what's all the different failure situations? How do we mitigate or eliminate or reduce those? And then the students are required to go through every time and to use that checklist. Now, 
frankly, they may skip that, and I, I, I can get on them, but but they go through that checklist and say, Did I turn on the safety light? Did I turn on? Yes, that is my family. Uh, did, <laughs> the balance we're all looking for, right? Jacob. Anyhow, we have a checklist, like, is the exhaust hood on? Um, do we have bypass systems in place? And, uh, and then for the, the forest fire burns, uh, those are done in my house. And so the, we, we, we interacted with the fire department, make sure we're approved, and then we have our own protocol for that and keep distance. Okay. Well, it sounds like exciting work and done with an extreme amount of care for both the safety of you and your students uh, and the surrounding environment, because as we all know, fires can get out of control. Yeah. Thank you so much, David for sharing your work with us tonight. And I think this concludes our program. Uh, I wanna invite our audience next Tuesday, uh, we'll be jumping into the world of augmented reality uh, with John Marr from varlio.com, V as in Victor, A-R-L-I-O.com. Take a look at his website if you like. Uh, but join us next Tuesday for a discussion of how we're going to, how he's going to, uh, how he does uses art and computer software for augmented reality to tell stories. And don't forget to check out uh, davincidays.org. Uh, perhaps jump into some of the other activities that we have going on this summer. It's been an exciting summer. And uh, despite the, the challenges we've all had, uh, I, I think we're rising to the challenge of, uh, of bringing our community together through Da Vinci Days once again this year. So again, thank you again for joining us. Thanks to our sponsors and to our production crew. We'll sign off for tonight. See you next week. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.